Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this programme today we'll be discussing how you can reach out in love to Holocaust survivors. Warm welcome to the programme and uh, today's uh, special guest is originally from the Midlands but he's now based up in Liverpool. His name is Pastor John Hemis who is a pastor at the Apostolic Church in Liverpool and also does great work for the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem. Uh, John, I know that you've been on uh, another programme I do called uh, Jerusalem Dispatch but it's great to have you in your own right on the Middle East Report. It's wonderful to be here Simon. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, and I'll let you off being an Aston Villa fan, a lifelong Aston Villa fan. Um, but I mean, we could we could talk football, but we need to talk about uh, your love for Israel and your passion for, for the Jewish people, because some of our viewers will learn watching this programme, some of the incredible practical way that you show love to Holocaust survivors, uh, to the Jewish people and to Israel uh, and actually are an incredible blessing to them. So should we start off with your your testimony, your very powerful testimony, how you came to faith? in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and how he's made a, a, a huge impact in your life. Absolutely. 1990, uh, I came into the kingdom of God. Um, I went for a two week holiday vacation to the America, um, liked the place. So I decided that I would forfeit my ticket to go home. And I had $60 in my pocket and decided that I'm going to give it a go in America. I was 23, um, never been there before and just had this incredible leaning to, to stay there. I, mean, I had a small business in Birmingham. Um, I kind of closed it and decided to give it a go. Ended up working for some lovely people in the Italian markets uh, on, the, on the front of the... Uh, you've got to go to see this. Where Rocky in the movie comes running through and he waves at all the people. I worked right there. Oh, well. Wow. Yeah, it was fun. I was having a blast. Um, then I eventually ended up moving to a little town called Annapolis, Maryland. And I worked on a sailboat, uh, renovated a sailboat. <laughs> the guy called this lady, Helen, that we knew and said, does that guy from Birmingham know anything about boats? I knew nothing, but I went, yeah, yeah, I could do something on a boat. And I did. I renovated it for him. Uh, and at that time, I bumped into this beautiful lady called Sherry, who's been my wife for 37 years. Um, and we got married in uh, 85. Um, and I'll be straight with you. I never went to church in my life. Um, I never had any, any inkling whatsoever to be a churchgoer. Knew nothing about God. Knew nothing. And in the late 1890, uh, no, 1890. <laughs> I didn't think you were that old. I know, I look good for that now. No. In the late, in late 1999, uh, sorry, I'm going to go back, sorry. Go back to uh, 1990, so it would be 1989, I'll get it right. At the end of that year, I put my son, who now is 35, Matthew, to bed, he was two. As I laid him down, I asked God, which I'd never prayed before in my life. I said, God, I could not be a child, like my, my father was to me. So I didn't want to be a father to my child like my father was to me. And that was my prayer. My dad was a tough guy, uh, ex-boxer. He just, he, he, he had some issues of life, Simon, that you had to be a child of his to really see them. So he was a bit tough on us. Uh, me, I, I know my, myself and my older brother had a, a bit more of a harder time. Um, and that's what I didn't want my son to have. Within eight weeks, I was in a timber yard um, asking for some lumber for a job I was building. Uh, I had my own constru construction company and a man walked up to me and said, I need a good builder for a picky customer. And I'm looking at this guy and the guy behind the counter said, he's one of our best builders. Go, take him. So I met this Jewish gentleman and I looked at the price you know, to, to do the whole house, to do all the renovation, give him a price. I got the job. He fought me on it, though, old Daryl, and I hope I'm making sure Daryl's <laughs> going to watch this show. He 
fought me on it, but <laughs> the first day I was there, um, a lady came down the stairs. She looked very distraught, looked like she'd been crying. Um, and so I, you know, I've got the hot place stripped down and I'm kind of looking up the stairs and she's walking down and first and foremost, I go, you look like death warmed up. And that's kind of my, my ways when I was a younger man. Very straightforward, could see something and said it. And she said, my husband's just passed away. And the, I know the people of this house are helping me take care of me, what, the grief and whatever. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, God, give me a shovel. I get in the hole. I'll dig it myself. Don't worry about it. And she said this. She said, but I know where my husband is. She said, my husband was baptized. He was filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And I know he's okay. And I'm staring at this woman thinking, do you smoke things in the morning, lady? Let's drink something a bit heavy in the... I have no idea what I'm, t you know, what I'm listening to. So the next thing is, Daryl comes home and, and he comes down the stairs and he says, straight out of his mouth, do you know why you're at my home? And I'm looking at him, got all the framework done and you know, we're working in there. And I looked at him and I went, you know why I'm here? And he went, you have prayed and God brought you to my house. Uh, Simon, you could have blew on me, I would have fell over. <laughs> it was powerful. So my older brother was kind of, there with me and Paul was like you've been doing what you know he shouts across the and I'm like oh, all I'm going to do is tell my older brother I've been praying so I was like get the tools you go home and I'll stay and talk to Daryl and he invited me to an apostolic church that Sunday never been to church in my life my, my, my lovely beautiful wife was a good Catholic girl so she went and I've been literally lying in bed on a Sunday morning going Say one for me, you know, whatever you do when you go there. So then I come home and tell my wife, um, I'm, I'm going to an apostolic church on Sunday. So she's like, you, you, you know, the place is going to be on fire if you get there. You know, So I didn't go out. Uh, really interesting. I, I, I hung around with a whole bunch of scousers, Liverpool people called the McAteer family. Uh, Jason played for Liverpool. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Jason actually worked for me for several months. Absolute useless in the building, but he could kick a ball, so there you go. <laughs> so yeah, no, that's what matters. <laughs> um, and I get a phone call, you know, all right there, John, lad, you know, you're coming out for the baby. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm going to go business in the morning. i got something to do. And I go, all right, we'll see you next week. So I didn't go out. I stayed at home and I went to bed, normal time. 3.30 in the morning, Simon, was what changed my life. I had a supernatural experience like none other. Well, I was asleep, I never forget, I woke up, I was lying on my left shoulder and I was rocked in my sleep. I could feel something pushing me. As I opened my eyes, I had a demonic spirit standing over my face. I can still see it as I'm looking at you, not you look like it. Like, but I looked up and I could see a finger, a physical body and it said, you are mine and you're staying with us. The most disgusting, gravelly voice, it was evil. And the only words that come out of my mouth, I just went, Jesus Christ. And that was a shout, of, that was a plea for help. That demonic spirit disappeared in front of me. I watched it go into the darkness. So I'm completely freaked out. I mean, you talk about fear, fear that you can't breathe, think. I just could not feel anything. I sat myself up on the bed, looked at the clock. It was 3.30 in the morning. As I'm sitting there, a wind came into my bedroom, like a, 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 a mighty rushing wind. It was so loud, I covered my, uh, my ears with my hands. I mean, I thought I was going to die. That's how loud this wind was. We lived on the, uh, by the Chesapeake Bay, so I've heard hurricanes come through the bay. It sounded like that hurricane was in my bedroom. And it went on for about 10 minutes. I just sat on the edge of my bed eventually. But it was such a beautiful, it became peaceful, but even though it was so, such a roaring sound, and I'm sitting there going, Either they're going to come through my door with a white jacket and cart me off, or this is really, you know, from some crazy stuff. And as it died down, I had a fireplace in the corner, I had a closet, and a, a light beam, literally of like a fluorescent tube, hit the skirting board and rose in the bedroom. So this is now it's quarter to four because I'm still looking at the clock. And inside of that light, it was the brightest golden white I've ever seen. I mean, burning my eyes, I got my, my eyes covered. So I cracked my finger open and looked and there was a man standing in that light. That morning, I went to an apostolic church. <laughs> Nothing was gonna stop me going to, and, and I've never left, that was 31 years ago. Amazing testimony, thank Amazing. you so much for sharing that, John. I, I wonder, God place a, a love and a passion for Israel and the Jewish people upon your heart as well. I mean, you. 
I mean, you talked about this uh, Jewish messianic leader really giving you that kind of Jewish insight when it comes down to the scriptures. But um, when, was, when did God place that love for Israel and the Jewish people upon your heart? I'm going to say it was nearly immediate. I've got this gentleman who was Jewish and I met his family and his father. Um, the insight that he had through the, through the Jewish perspective was really the way he started me in my journey, learning the scriptures. So when I could see that where I understood where our faith came from, it was from Judaism. We, we are the extension of, you know, I mean, some people spoke specific about a replacement. No, we're the extension of it. If it wasn't for the Jewish community who received the Holy Ghost at the day of Pentecost, there wasn't going to be a church. The original church was to the Jews first. So we are the continuation of what happened in Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. So it's always been there. I had that teaching that this is who Israel is. And I must say, at 29, I didn't really know much about Israel. Today, I've spent 31 years making sure I know exactly where I'm from. Amazing. And do you want to just talk us through your, your quite incredible church, the Apostolic Church uh, in Liverpool. That's the church you pastor. And the, and the role model is because churches are supposed to reach out to the local community. And I think you do that in the most incredible and amazing way and really are an example to, to other churches. It's been a labour of love for 21 years. We're in a tough area, but in Highton in Liverpool. Uh, and unfortunately, there are some cases there that we are up against. You've got a lot of, uh, you know, young, young ladies who are having children. You've got a lot of drug and alcohol abuse. I mean, you've got loads. We, we tick all the boxes where we are. So when I first got there, I could see there was a need. Christianity, we are supposed to help people who are in need of food, clothing, whatever, water, you know, whatever we need, what we can give to them. So we had this old building that had probably was... Uh, built in 1935, it was dedicated to the Quakers, from the Quakers to the Brethren. So it was one of their buildings back in the 30s. Uh, it run to, gone to rack and ruin. But the, the original church, when I got there, there was eight ladies from Liverpool, precious, and there's just wonderful ladies. But they bought the building for £6,000. And when I got there, it was very much, you know, it was, it was done to a point where you could use it. So I saw the potential of what we could do with it. And I'm a builder. So I had a quick vision in the old part of the building. I was preaching and I had this flash of, of, of a church, a, a nursery, Sunday school rooms, a youth center. I mean, offices, conference rooms. And I'm like, wow. And I told the people that I was preaching to, I've just seen that. Well, that was, would have been back in 2002. I started the process in 2008 and everything that I've just said to you was completed by 2016. So we have, I call it the, uh, grave, uh, the cradle to the grave. So we have the, the children taken care of. So between the age of uh, zero to five, and then we have outreaches for food, uh, whatever the, uh, the community are looking for. We have counselors for mental health. We have rape counselors. Uh, we have old age pensioners come in there and use the building. You know, we, we've, we've got such a, a plethora of different uh, activities that go on for a community. And my goal always was to see if we can reach into the community. Today, we have several members of that community who have been uh, faithful, faithful members of the church. Amazing. So uh, your son, Patrick, has uh, produced this for us, which uh, gives us a guided tour of the Apostolic Church uh, in Liverpool. Hi, my name is Patrick. I am a minister at the uh, Apostolic Church of Liverpool up in Heighton, Liverpool, and uh, I run our business center that's on our premises as well. So I wanted to show you our facilities and talk about what we're trying to do up here and the, the model we're trying to um, lay out as an example for other churches to potentially follow as, as we've uh, worked to refine it and make sure it is self-sustaining. So you'll have to excuse the uh, traffic noise, but I'm out in the middle of the road so you can see the building. Uh, right there is our nursery, straight ahead. So I can't take you in the nursery, uh, safeguarding and all that. The vision was to touch people's lives from, from cradle to grave. And uh, what better way to do that than by opening a nursery? So we cater to zero to five years old. We have a preschool and qualified teachers. 
So um, yeah, we, we get to start touching lives from the very beginning. It draws in a lot of foot traffic from the community and the surrounding area. So it's a, it's a great outreach and a, and a great um, business that helps support the church. And then this is our church. That's a newly built sanctuary. So coming into the church, we uh, built this in about 2007, 2008. We're just decorating for the uh, nursery graduation today. Hello, that's my wife. She's on the management team. And uh, this is our church. Yep, so this was built from ground up in about 2007, 2008. Uh, quite miraculous how, how God provided uh, the materials, the, the labor force. It was absolutely amazing. So right now um, we have a, a, a nursery graduation every year for the kids going to big school. So they'll be coming in in their caps and their gowns and their parents, grandparents, guardians will all come and uh, get to see their, their little ones graduate. So, And then over from the church, we have the business center. That is the old church building that was converted back in about 2011 or so. So this is the business center. It's the old, our old church building. And um, that's, that's the old sanctuary. And this is how it looks now. So there's just office spaces, rooms for hire, and upstairs are more offices. So again, it, it, it works as a good revenue stream to support the church and the ministries. This is really what's come to be what we would call a community room. So every Friday, that's when most of our community services take place. We run our own um, kind of a food bank. We don't require vouchers or anything like that. It's really just a matter of getting the word out there, getting people in need through the doors. And you know, they get 25, 30 pounds of groceries for um, I think it's five pounds. We also set up for a coffee morning. We, uh, we really wanted to open things up and get people out of isolation and knowing that there are people around that care and, and happy to chat. And Fridays, it, it, it's a day that people just look forward to getting out who may not have anyone else to come talk to. And we're also working on uh, debt and financial advice. And also um, we are in the middle of negotiating a, a recovery program for uh, addiction. The nursery, the business center, the church, they all work together as a portfolio. So one business suffers, the others support. Um, they can help fund all these different services. Yeah, so we're trying to touch lives from the beginning to the end. And uh, it's, it's a, the, the model has been successful even in a uh, quite, quite, quite tough area. Thank you, Patrick, for putting that together. A great job, especially it's short notice. So if you're in the Liverpool area, look, you're looking for a Bible-believing church that loves Israel, there you go. There's the Apostolic Church, and you know what it looks like now. Um, John, you want to replicate something very similar to this in Israel as well, to, to meet some of the awful social problems that, that Israel is dealing with. Um, can you share with us a little, I know you can't share too much, but you can share a little bit of how you want to share your model of what you've been able to achieve with your church, which is incredible, reaching out to the, to the com local community, becoming self-sufficient, uh, and then want to replicate that model in Israel. We, um, uh, we've, uh, okay, let me, get, let me just step you back. Of course. Uh, rugby and Nottingham, uh, we, um, I, I was part of the fellowship, on, I was a superintendent for the district and I started to uh, like lead the way and got other churches to look at what we were attempting to do. And a couple of the churches did it as themselves, they had a dare they, in the community and we know it works. We're also waiting for Milton Keynes. We've got a large project there that my son's going to be doing uh, for another church to do the same again. So we know it works. We've, we've seen it work in this, in this country. So we are looking at the smaller villages and towns around the, I mean, the whole country, not just one part, to bring you know, a community in, in with uh, MDA, the Megan David Adam, Red Star of David. So I think they've got 1,745 stations around the nation. Um, but when you go, when I notice when you're in the smaller towns, there's quite a distance to the next MDA station. So I know of the, a lot of the problems. Um, I work alongside uh, with the UJIA and the ICEJ. Um, they, they are working on a project outside of Galilee, which is going to bring in all the disenfranchised youth. 
but that will be that part of that area. We're going to get involved in hopefully doing something like we have done in Liverpool. So after speaking to MDA and making an offer to them that say we will renovate anything, any buildings to turn it into a community hub and then we can put an MDA, either, you know, ambulance car or bike or even an ambulance themselves. They can have an office, you know, again, I'm a builder so we can take the crews to do this. So we're going to start raising the funds to go into maybe several areas of Israel and to what you've just seen, uh, what Patrick just showed you, so then we can bring in all different communities, the Arabs and the Jews together, you know, whomsoever will let them come. So we're going to replicate, we hope and pray, what we've done also around Israel. Amazing, amazing. And um, can you share us the challenges that you face uh, of being a pastor? It's not easy being a, a <laughs> pastor in this day and age. Uh, it really isn't because of the spiritual attacks and, uh, and the difficulties and, and so many dissensions within the body of Christ um, in this country and across the Western world, but, but also the importance of, of standing up for Israel and preaching the truth about Israel and the Jewish people from, from the pulpit. Can you share the, the challenges of being a church that is openly pro-Israel? Um, we are very openly pro-Israel, and I think that is the, uh, the best way to be. You know, there's no grey areas with us. That's what we do. And if you've got a problem with it, come and talk to us and we'll explain what we do. So I think if, you don't, if you're not strong with it, then that's when you get your challenges. But if I think when you are strong, your challenges back away. They, they, what, what, they're going to change my, my, my mind, my ideas? No, that's not going to change. So I, I've had some uh, in, in the umbrella of Christianity make comments, you know, and literally I, I, I'm going to say this as kindly as I can, Simon, but sometimes ignorance isn't bliss. When they can't understand who the church is and where we're from and when, you know, pray for Israel, pray for Jerusalem. I love the, the promise that was given to Abraham. I'll bless those that bless you. Amen. And I'll curse those that curse you. God bless me as we bless Israel. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, but the, but there, is a, there is a big theological challenge these days, isn't there? Mm. To, to stand up for Israel. It, it takes brave and courageous pastors like yourself with that courage and conviction to actually preach about Israel, but also, also preach about the end times in which we're living in. So, so that the Christians uh, who, who can really know what's going on in the world uh, and know that God is sovereign, but also know how important um, prophetically the times in which we're living in today. Mm, absolutely. I think we are missing uh, the greatest opportunity for, to preach the gospel right now. I think we've got so secularised inside of the church that we are more like the world than, than, than we've ever been before. So when you have such a strong belief, and I'm saying a strong belief in your faith, in following, adhering to the scripture, and I believe I said it earlier, when you follow the commandments and you can see the right from the wrongs, and you stick to the rights, and you also have many people that don't like you to stick up for the rights, because it does create conviction. But when you understand that the, the, the commandments are God's love to his creation, so the creation doesn't hurt itself and then one another. So I'm in that position that, I, you know, I, I do get the odd shots coming across the bow, but I'm not going to change, Simon. So if you want to know who we are, and I always say this, just ask us. So I am looking at, you know, the, the, the world of uh, Christendom we are now involved in. It's not like it used to be. People are frightened to speak up. People are frightened to actually say what they feel and think. I think when you know what you feel and think and it's that clear, people are more interested to find out why you're so strong than you won't really tell them the truth. So I'm not going anywhere. Uh, my, my church is very much a pro-Israel church, but I'm also pro, you know, the, the Arabs. I mean, I, I will help anybody. You know, even our food bank, we have a lot of the immigrants come through us. We, and there's never a, a divide in my mind or heart. I've been to the school in Akko that you, you JIA have. I've, I've been there with the Muslim teachers and the Jewish te teachers and the children are mixed. When you hear their perspective of things, we want to help everybody because once you can get cohesion, we'll get peace. Amen. I meant to that. Uh, uh, John, can you share with us uh, your story uh, of how 
you have a, a, tremendous, a tremendous love for Holocaust survivors um, because you've been involved with the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem yep. uh, with helping to renovate the homes of, of Holocaust survivors. So can you share a little bit about how that started and, and the difference that has made, made in their lives and the difference it's made in your lives? Huge difference in our life. Um, when we was there three years ago, obviously I would, I would have been back a, a lot more, but because of the lockdown, it wasn't happening. Uh, again, go, going to the foundation of how I got into, into the kingdom of God, the man who taught me, uh, it was a Jewish man, still had his feast with his family, but he was a Christian. So that was the original foundation for me. And then obviously meeting his father, I mean, I loved his father, Julian. I mean, just he, he, this dear old man and, you know, he just, a, I, I, I'd never really met anybody Jewish in a sense. You know, I'm from Birmingham and we don't have massive Jewish communities in Birmingham, but even when I was a young man in the 60s and the 70s. So it opened up only because if you want to, if you want to look at the, um, the issues that Israel have, I've always been one to fight against bullies, right? So I've always had this, well, why can't Israel fight for themselves? Why, why when they get 750 rockets coming over the walls and the, the, the media says, look what Israel have done, they've gone and took a school out. Well, they didn't report the day before of the 700. So it's always bothered me that what can we do to help? Can I just do one little thing? And I always think, feel that one little thing can turn into two to eight to 20 to 100 to 1,000 and onwards. So that's always been my goal, is to get into Israel, see where I can help. And it began when we went to Haifa for the Holocaust survivors. Excellent. Uh, let's have a look now at, uh, this is called Encounter Israel, Haifa home for Holocaust uh, survivors. And uh, this is produced by ICJ. You know, when we talk about home, the first association is to speak about family. And this home indeed has become family for the survivors. It all started in 2010. Shimon Shabak, who directs today this house, he had a small soup kitchen here in this neighborhood and he saw that Holocaust survivors were coming to his soup kitchen and he felt if there are needy Holocaust survivors, we need to do something about it. And he asked us to come and he showed us a small apartment where he wanted to host 13 Holocaust survivors. He said, can the Christian Embassy help us to purchase that building? I looked at the entire building, which was a four-store building. I felt the Lord talk to me and I said, Shimon, why don't we buy the entire house? I was driving away from Haifa and I thought, oh my gosh, what did I do? And how do we ever get this money together? I was pleading with the Lord, please help us. We have five months time to get the money together. For me, the biggest miracle was to see within two weeks, people were sending us so much money like never before that after two weeks we could purchase that building. And within those five months which we had, we could even purchase two buildings. אני רואה גם שיש פה יד אלוהים במקום הזה. וללא המחקם בין השגרות הנוצרית ליד עזר לחבר, המקום הזה לא יכל להתפתח. אז אני רואה בזה, במדרגה ראשונה את הדבר הטוב ביותר שקורה, ולא סתם אה, באים לפה בני נוער, אה, חיילים, שהם שומעים שנוצרים, הם מחזיקים את המקום, הם מתנדבים במקום, זה מראה שאפשר גם את ההיסטוריה לשנות בצורה טובה, והשגרות הנוצרית היא דוגמה. לכל הנוצרים בעולם, איך אפשר לעשות דברים אחרת, ואתם עושים את זה גם ככה. (מחיאות כפיים) 
what I could see is that this house is providing an inner healing to those people to deal with their past in a, in a positive way. You know, as a German, to see this home, and it's very humbling in many ways. You come from a country which uh, wrote the darkest chapter of Jewish history, and today to be here and to see that you are able to open a new page in the life of the Jewish people, that's it's very touching. People from all over the country, they are applying, we want to be at the home for Holocaust survivors. And the very sad story for me is that many of them we have to tell, no, we don't have the finances to add more people to it. So it's really my vision that by the end of this year, even we have a hundred people here, or that we can expand this house here in this next few years, uh, even for a couple of hundred survivors. Time is running out in Israel and we need your help to continue this operation here in Haifa and even to expand it. The keys are in your hand. Please help us to open the door and welcome them home. And that's uh, thanks to ICJ who are doing incredible work in helping uh, Holocaust survivors and actually building a home for survivors to live, to live in. Um, and it's so important, isn't it? I mean, uh, I don't know how many survivors I've had the absolute privilege of being able to interview and tell their stories. It must be in, in double figures now, the uh, amount of people, uh, survivors, that can tell their stories. I've sat down with them and just gone through their very difficult, emotional, but also powerful and encouraging stories. And the one thing that is a characteristic in most of them, not all of them, but most of them, um, is this tremendous uh, joy for life. Uh, and uh, like the most optimistic, encouraging people you could ever meet. And you think, well, if anyone deserves to have a chip on their shoulder and, and to be angry, it's them. But they don't. There's, and most of them, I found, have got no hatred in their hearts towards, towards the Nazis or the Germans. Um, and just have forgiven them in their hearts. And they're the most incredible, special people. Uh, what, what's your experience of uh, meeting uh, and uh, helping to re renovate the homes of, of survivors. That's everything you've just said, Simon, is what, what I saw and it was, look, I, I actually recognise some of the faces too. Uh, when we went there, there was, uh, you, you can't believe the, what they went through and when you actually sit down one-on-one, -on -one, we just wept. I mean, you got these rufty tufty builders or just weeping, you know, it was amazing. But just to, to, to hear that atrocities, I mean, I, 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 I want to say one, she was so, she was a beautiful lady. She was, again, full of life. She made us feel so welcome. You know, we were doing the tiniest of little thing to help her, but she was so appreciative, so grateful. And she told us of the time that she was thrown into, on a death march, thrown into a trench. And a lady pulled her underneath her as they shot everybody in the trench and she survived. She got out, they recaptured her and took her back to Auschwitz. Well, the way she explained it to us, one of the men that I took with me could speak fluent German. So she was telling him in German, and I'm saying to Tony, what, what are you saying? Because Tony had tears just dripping off his, off his chin. So when he's trying to tell us, we're all crying with him, and she's looking at us with a sweetest smile, going, thank you for helping us. And I'm like, oh my God. This is absolutely all I can do, you know, to, to, to help you and of what you've been through and you're still so joyful. Everybody should meet a Holocaust survivor. Absolutely. Would change their mentality, their perspective on life like none other. Absolutely. And then you can really say you've got no problems when yeah. you meet a survivor yes. in comparison. Um, now, uh, John, John, um, tell us a, a, the story of, of how it all began. How did you end up uh, renovating the homes of Holocaust survivors because it's a lovely thing to do no it's an amazing thing to do and you know knowing that uh, many of them are kind of destitute many of them don't have family in Israel many have mm -hmm. come from the former Soviet Union 
and uh, the partners died. So many of them are kind of lonely and living below the poverty line. Yeah. Uh, and I know that the government of Israel does care passionately about them. That's why Israel went into an early lockdown. That's why they went into severe lockdown to preserve as many survivors as possible during COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but how did this story begin with you? And how did you end up being in the homes or in the homes of Holocaust survivors with a building crew and renovating their homes? I mean, it's fantastic. Uh, God. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Seriously. Well, I knew that would be the answer. But, uh, I wanted the story. I can go up. home now. I've said what I need to say. Um, every year, it, it's, it's awesome the way God orchestrates things. So every year, we always took the men somewhere. I have got to America. We went to Poland. I took them to Auschwitz, actually, about 10, 12 years ago. So I always take a group of men somewhere to do something. Just, you know, get great camaraderie. And in 2000, I'm going to say 18... Uh, I had an email come across my desk. I had no idea who the ICEJ was, but it was from Will, who was the project manager at the Haifa home. And it was, we need builders, we need sewing supplies. We need, and, and I just looked at this email and I don't know how I got it, seriously. So I just hit reply, what do you need? Comes back. Uh, we need a building crew, we need, well, this is what we're doing. And I said, give me blueprints, and he gave me the blueprints. I looked at them, and again, I've been in the construction industry for 40 some years. I looked at these prints and went, not a problem, we can do that. So I make an announcement from the pulpit and say, men, all women, <laughs> we're going to Israel, we're going to go and do some Holocaust survivors' homes. So that was this door that opened. We arrive, we spent 14 hour days doing all the construction for them. Um, just, but they're one of the greatest things I've ever experienced. And I've experienced a lot of things, Simon, but this was so meaningful. I mean, you talk about personal satisfaction, you can't put this on any type of level. It's just awesome. So that was when ICEJ and I met. So now I'm obviously a member of the, uh, I'm under leadership with them, uh, but I'm about to also go back into the Haifa home I'm going next month uh, to see what, what else we can do for them. So I just, I, I, you know what, I'd even go and live there. <laughs> and this is renovating the apartments of Holocaust survivors. The ICEJ Haifa Home for Holocaust Survivors, an assisted living care facility where elderly Holocaust survivors experience a loving family environment. Since 2009, through the love and support of Christians around the world, ICJ has had the privilege of taking care of Holocaust survivors in this unique home. And in 2018, we launched an exciting renovation and expansion called Project Upgrade. Through the years that we have been here, there is a lot of need for repairs because the buildings are old. But what is most important for us and for every volunteer is that their life will be easier because that's our goal, that these people will live out their life, you know, in the best way possible, in, in, in a loving atmosphere, but also easy, practically seen. My name is John Hemus and we live in Liverpool, England. I am a pastor of the Apostolic Church of Liverpool and I met the ICEJ through an email advertising that they was purchasing some new buildings and I decided to ask some men that work for us if they would come and help to renovate the apartments for the Holocaust survivors. It's quite emotional uh, to see that the thanks and the, just the appreciation that we see if you can understand when you see somebody that has been through so, so much trauma and hurt and pain and you can do something to help that's you know a tiny tiny drop of the ocean but it's been very emotional and i'm not going to say no more and i'm very happy that people who are living in israel think about us and continue לעשות טוב לאנשים אחרים, אז תודה לכל אלו שבאים, שעושים למעננו, ותמשיכו לבוא. We feel anything we can do to help, we will, but it's really impressive how much appreciation you get back from them. לכל המתנדבים אני שולחת תודה רבה. 
מקרב לב, וגם כלכלית עוזרים לנו, וגם בשיפוצים ובבתים שלנו. אז באמת תודה רבה מקרב לב. Three times a week we come together for prayer, for worship, for just uh, praying for one another, uh, sharing, and these times are always very powerful because we always tell people we are here to build walls and we're here to, uh, you know, put in screws and repair stuff, but uh, our impact is so much deeper and we see that the impact is not just here in the home itself, but that also the volunteers that come are deeply impacted in their own lives. Hearing the Holocaust survivors' stories, it's just, it's pure inspiration, and um, it just, it makes me want to uh, do good for the rest of my life. Fantastic reaction to see the, um, all different nations, everybody, we have Germans, we have Swiss, the English, the Dutch, um, and I would hope that anybody that watches this from anywhere would want to be, in, be involved in this. His work is phenomenal, it's fantastic. To see everyone working together with the same accord in one place, I love it. And we will be back quicker than later, sooner than later. Support the ICEJ Haifa Home for Holocaust Survivors by visiting icej.org slash Haifa. Don't know about you, but uh, for me, that was absolutely inspiring and inspirational. And, and just to be able to bring a blessing to those Holocaust survivors uh, in the last years of their life is something um, incredibly special and very moving. Uh, what can I say? You, you spoke about it, but it's not until we actually showed the video of you and your team working on, on the homes of the survivors and renovating them. It's uh, so touching and so moving, and it's so important to show that love and appreciation for who they are are but also for what they've been through it's amazing Simon and I would love to see everybody that watches this get on board with us absolutely Seriously. So, so maybe on my next question this is this an open invitation now to, to our viewers watching because we don't know who's watching this program nope. um, if they want to get involved uh, and they're practical uh, they have building skills and they want to help uh, renovate a home of a Holocaust survivor how, how can they do it John well, you can see the information on, on or you've got my information on there as well. But if you can just once more show the, the, the two different links, uh, all they're going to do is send an email and we'll email back and get them involved. Uh, excellent. So your contact details are on your website. It, it was just on the actual screen right there and I've just seen it with my own eyes. Very, very good. We put that up especially. That's uh, Luke doing a good job. Um, yeah, so what did you come away from that, that experience? Um, you know, because... Sadly, there are very few survivors left. Um, mm. Soon we'll get to a stage where there won't be that first-hand experience yeah. of the evils or the absolutely depths that humanity can sink uh, with the Holocaust in which over six million precious uh, Jewish lives were murdered on an industrial scale by the Nazis during the Second World War. Uh, and to think that they survived that genocide, uh, they're there to tell their story, to tell the world the, the warnings of, of what potentially can happen again. Um, and without them being around, um, our hearts will become less sensitive, I think, to, to the Holocaust going forward. So we have to support them as much as we can, but, but also to show them that love and appreciation in, in their latter years because of what they've been through uh, and the incredible people that they are, because they are special people. To survive what they've survived is, is just absolutely incredible. Well, they've seen the worst of humanity, haven't they? Absolutely. They've experienced it. When, when, you, when you go there and you see these, they are precious people. I've never met anybody like them, to be honest with you. That's why I think when I, <laughs> I was like, <gasps> oh, you, know, you could see me getting so emotional. Um, it, it, was, it was such a, uh, a, a moment that you and I would never experience what they experienced. Probably today in the world, I mean, I know there's atrocities going on, but as a group of people, that what they experienced is just beyond human comprehension. 
And me looking at uh, what we saw when we was there, we need to continue to keep the education going. Make as many movies as you can of the people that survive. Let go into schools with it. Let universities go. Let, let everybody keep in front of them what happened back in the Second World War because they are precious, wonderful people. And they are the loveliest, kindest, happy. How can you be happy, son? <laughs> You know, we, we've got private places that we need to go and think these days. That, you know, no, what they went through and still had a life and they still gave to, you know, other people. And it's just amazing. Amazing. I mean, I mean, rec recently I recorded a programme with, with two Holocaust survivors on the Middle East and our viewers would have watched it. And um, what is so extraordinary is that, so from going from nothing, uh, of absolute de of desperation during the Holocaust, trying to... Uh, um, eat food, trying to stay alive, danger constantly all around, having family members murdered by, by the Nazis, by the SS and others, and then finding out that you survived that and then being put on a ship to Israel because you want to go to the only place in the world that is accepting Jewish people, and that's uh, the British Mandate of Palestine. Finding yourself on the Exodus ship, then being sent back uh, and... Um, having uh, the Royal Navy board the ship and that ship being tacked and then being sent all the way back to France and then be put in a, uh, a displaced persons camp in yep. Germany. Yep. Uh, and then once the state of Israel is declared to go to Israel and then to become, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, a deputy uh, chief uh, commodore in the, in the Israeli Air Force and to fly in as a navigator in, in almost Israel's major wars, 56 the Six Day War in 67, Yom Kippur War 73, yeah. uh, and the contribution that they make to Israeli society and Jewish life is, is absolutely incredible yeah. after all that they've been through. Yep. The, one, of the, one of the gentlemen on there, Shlomo, we met him, we loved him. He, was, he fought in the same wars. Uh, but what, a, what an incredible gentleman. So peaceful, so kind, but a rock. Yeah. He, knew, he knew what he fought for, and he saw, he saw it with his own eyes at his nation now today. It's not the stablest, we know that, but I'm hoping and praying if we can help in any way to bring the conflict together and they can see that we can all live together and we can do that in a community base and we can do it all through Israel and let the world see that it is possible. How awesome would that be? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what, what message do, do you have for, for our viewers who have may, never, uh, maybe have never met a Holocaust survivor? I mean, I'm in a very privileged position where I've been able to make friends with survivors, interview survivors, tell their stories. But I am very, very privileged to have been able to do that and to make programmes with them and interviews to share their stories. But for those of our viewers who have never met a survivor, how important is that we actually reach out to them in love to say never again, but also offer the hand of Christian friendship and solidarity with them? Absolutely. Also just a humanitarian approach. Yeah. We don't and cannot comprehend what they went through, Simon. None of us can. But we have still, uh, I know that there's a circuit, I've been to a, a several meetings where they've had Holocaust survivors speak, Google that and find out where some of them are, are still today talking. It will blow you, it, I mean, I've been to them and it just blew my mind. And that really, I should have brought that up earlier. That was one of the things that I listened to years ago up in the um, King David School in uh, Liverpool. And I went to it. And I was just amazed at the strength of this old gentleman that had been through hell on earth. And he was just this solid human being that had become successful in life. And it, does he deserve to be bitter and angry? Of course he does. But they decide not to. They decide to be forgiving. And when I would listen to this gentleman, I'm like, i got to go and meet more. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened when we got to Haifa. And what role do you think Christians can play in this? Because clearly we know that uh, that generation in the Christian evangelical generation, the 1930s and 40s, let down the Jewish people. I can only think of the uh, Evian conference that took place, I think, in France in 1938, yep. where the world turned their back on the Jewish people. They rejected or even wanted to accept Jewish people to come in their country. Uh, you know, Britain is a, a classic example of that. With the British mandate, we could have saved maybe over a million Jewish people from the Holocaust if we, if we didn't have the green and white papers and we didn't restrict Jewish immigration in the time when they needed the most. You only have to look at the United States, which has been the greatest home for the Jewish people of any Gentile nation 
on, on the planet. Uh, and yet uh, the ship called, known as the St. Louis, they refused entry and all those people that were on board that cruise ship yep. were go wanted to go to America. They even went to Havana to try and get uh, safety, but they were, were told they couldn't uh, disembark in, in, uh, in Cuba, then had to go back to Germany and they all perished in the Holocaust. Maybe there were a few survivors, they're not many. And, and so the whole Western world rejected the Jewish people. Um, uh, how important is it that we write a new chapter uh, in Christian Jewish relations, particularly as it relates to these amazing people who are the survivors? It's vital. What's amazing though is the Israelites are God's people. Amen. Simple. Um, again, I, I, I look at this as a spiritual battle too. Darkness has always come against Israel, always. Darkness detests the people of God. Christianity, the world still has that detestability towards Christianity. But Jesus said it himself, they're going to hate you because they hate me. He's, he's very clear, you know, we're going to have a fight on our hands. So when you look at the darkness, everything that's always come against Israel, you go back 4,000 years, when Abraham walked around Canaan and God promised him, your descendants will live here, they'll, they'll outnumber the sand on the seashore and the stars of the heaven. We know whose land it is. It was given to them. It's a God-mandated given land. So today we still see them in their own land, but they have been through thousands of years of complete nightmares. Yes, they was rejected, but God said, I'm going to bring them back to their place. And that is what's been happening since 1948. They are coming home to their land. And the, and the awesome thing is, if you and I can make any difference than this TV show, the listeners today, we can get together and make a huge difference for Israel. And awesome. I'd love to see that happen. Well, I think you do that anyway, John. Trying. From everything, everything that you're doing and all these proposals and your work with Holocaust survivors, I think that's what you're doing. And that's why I wanted you on the program to, to be an example and inspiration to people to realise what you can do just by standing up for the truth, just by loving uh, the Jewish people and loving uh, the Holocaust survivors in, in particular. I know that you have a special love for and, and, and uh, the, the, the power that that has in their lives. What impact has it made in the survivor's life to know that you've gone into their homes that are probably being a bit, uh, uh, need a lot of uh, uh, attention. They need that uh, re renovation. So they have lovely new homes to go in. What's their response after you do that? You, you've just got to see that for yourself. Um, I know a lot of them come from quite deplorable conditions when they've come back into the country as well. Uh, to have what they have. And I, again, you, you've got to go and see that nice little apartment. You know, they get three wonderful meals a day. I mean, people can sponsor the actual home. People can sponsor an apartment. Uh, and again, go through the ICEJ channel to see that. But the gratefulness, the attitude they have towards you, uh, you, you can't get that in any other, other, other society. You really can't, Simon. And I've looked for it and I've never found it. They have proven to me that humans can have such an incredible forgiveness for somebody that was so demeaning and derogatory to that nation and what they did, and they still don't hold it in their hearts. That changed me. To see that and go, I've got no complaints. <laughs> I've got no issues of life whatsoever. That's what changed my thinking. To see somebody like that with no animosity, no hate, no anger, and uh, I still always say, they kind of should have had that ability to turn around and go, I can't believe you did this to us. But they don't. They've moved on in life. They're not victims. They're Absolutely. survivors and they are victorious. Ab absolutely, and it's about victorious living as well, isn't it? Yeah. So within, within 30 seconds, um, how can uh, our viewers that may be in Liverpool or looking for a church, uh, attend your church, and how can they get involved with your work in helping survivors? Well, with, his, with the website, I'm looking at it now. Uh, come and visit us. You can attach uh, an email to that website and talk to us. We have people that man that site. Um, come and visit us if you want to come and see the, the reality of God too. Uh, we have many, many miraculous uh, events. We've had cancers. We've had uh, different diseases healed completely. I mean, we've got even medical records. So if you're in the local area of Liverpool or if you're passing through, come and see us. Uh, John, I want to thank you so much uh, for being my special guest on the Middle East Report and uh, thank you for sharing your, your amazing work and what you do. Love it. Well, thank you very much, Simon. It's been pleasure. a pleasure to be with you again. Pleasure. And I want to thank you for watching this program at home and I think it's absolutely imperative that as, as Christians with a heart and a love for Israel and the Jewish people, 
that we reach out to Holocaust survivors. There's not many of them left. And what better way that they can finish the end of their lives on this earth by showing them the, the Christian love that they deserve. Uh, because after all, they have been through so much. And what a nicer way to actually show that love by re, uh, renovate, regener uh, renovating their homes uh, and making it really nice places for them to live. So I want to thank you to all the Holocaust survivors. They are bravery and courage in telling their stories. Please continue to pray for them. And thank you for watching this edition of the Middle East Report.